with this young lady's husband and I uh, getting together at their house 16 years ago and having some beer and pizza for the SLS conference. And then, uh, then later on in that year, Tim and I talked about about uh, doing it in the next year, and uh, so and Kathy and Tim graciously had it in their house, and then it just developed into what it is today. And uh, we just we really want to thank you all for 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 coming and being a part of this. So this is a very special event this year, as we all know. And uh, what I'd like to do right now is introduce you to to Tim's wife, Kathy. His mom, Ada, and his stepfather, um, Sel, are here with us. And if they would stand, please. I just um, want to say that... Um, I appreciate all your support. And I know that Tim, Paul, and Carl are here with us in spirit. I could feel them yesterday. I can feel them today. And I know that they would all be going, what is all this attention about? Because all three of them were very humble. And they, they would just want ChaserCon to keep going and go on and have all this stuff done. And for everyone to have a good time and to do like every year. So. Um, from both of our families, thank you for all the support you've given us, and let's get started with ChaserCon this year. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a lot of you know that uh, I, I come from a military family and I also spent 20 years in the United States Air Force and retired quite a few years ago. <laughs> and one thing that was always tradition in the, in the military is if you had a fallen comrade, they set up a table for that comrade. Directly behind me, behind at that table, you will find a, a half moon shaped table with three seats. And those are the seats for Carl, Paul, and Tim. And there's also a book sitting on top of each one of those seats. And we invite you to please, sometime while you're here, take your time and go back and write something in there. If you have a picture of any of them, you're welcome to put it in there, anything that you want to. But we just ask you to please uh, visit that area back there for us, okay? All right. With that, Kathy, do you have something else you want to say? No, that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a surprise. We didn't want to say anything. Okay. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. And a lot of you know him from the Weather Channel, uh, Mike Bettis. And uh, he's going to talk to us about his experience in El Reno. And Mike, you're on. You know, I grew up in Ohio, uh, and when I was a kid, the only thing you ever heard about when it came to tornadoes was Xenia, Ohio, uh, during the super outbreak. And so, as a child, I was really influenced by the super outbreak and what happened in Xenia. And I thought, you know, as a kid, you don't really know a lot, but I, and I thought every tornado was like that. Um, you know, here to find out, the, the older you get, the more 
more you know and the more you learn that, you know, not every tornado is like that. But in my mind, that's how it was. And, you know, we would practice with my family. I can't even tell you how many times we ran in the basement, you know, in fear of another Xenia. And I think my parents had that fear too, especially when they had two small kids, me and, me and my sister. And then, you know, gradually over time, you know, I became a little older and started to experience weather and appreciate weather. My dad and I would, you know, sit there in the garage with the door open and watch thunderstorms, you know, roll into the neighborhood. And I was fascinated by it. And when I, when I ended up going to high school and all my friends were trying to figure out what they wanted to do when they went to college and they all were going to be engineers. And I was like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds okay, but yeah, everyone's doing it. I don't, I don't really think I want to be an engineer. But I love science and I love math. And I was like, oh, you know what? Dude, meteorology would be so cool. Is that even like a major? Um, and so, and so I, I was like, well, I'll, I'll check it out and see. And lo and behold, I found out that Ohio State actually had a meteorology program. It wasn't very big, but it was only an hour down the road. I was like, cool, I can do that. This is going to be awesome. Ended up going to Ohio State, getting a degree in meteorology, chasing with a few friends on occasion. If you've ever chased in Ohio, it's not a great place to chase. <laughs> um, just not, there's just not enough action there, to be honest with you. And you um, roads are good. But other than that, if you can avoid the potholes. Um, but uh, once I graduated from college and, and ended up getting a, a job in television, uh, I ended up working in Columbus, Ohio. And it just happened to be, while I was there, it was the 25th anniversary of the Xenia tornado. And I had gone back to Xenia and seen, you know, for myself, what it was like, what the people were like there. They all remember it like it was yesterday. And it's interesting when you go through some of those neighborhoods, the trees that they've left in there, has anybody ever been to Xenia before and seen the trees that are still stumps there? That the neighbors, the, the neighborhoods have kind of left as a, as a memento of the tornado. It's, a, it's amazing to see, um, you know, so much time later that that's, that's what it's like. Uh, but that's kind of how things started for me and then it was shortly after that I begged my news director to let me go storm chasing. We can do this great, you know, we can do this great piece for, you know, for, uh, for sweeps, for ratings period, it'll be awesome. He's like, no, that's stupid. You don't do that. I was like, it's going to be awesome. Listen, we can go to Texas or Oklahoma and chase. He's like, no, that's done. So the next year, I bugged him again. Let's go, let's go chase. He's like, no, I'm not wasting my money. You're not going to see me now. So then finally, the third year, I said, come on, let's go storm chasing. He's like, all right, if you're going to get off my back, I'll let you go. So uh, I was an inexperienced storm chaser. We hooked up with a, a chase group that did tours, and me and my photographer ended up that day accidentally getting separated from them. And it was Easter Sunday, and storms hit Shreveport, Louisiana. We ended up seeing six tornadoes in one day. And I thought, wow, this chasing is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, a half a dozen tornadoes, like in one day, done and done. Called the news director and said, hey, guess what? Just saw six tornadoes and we've only worked six hours. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, and he was, he, he couldn't believe it. So it was, it was pretty funny. But anyway, once I got to, uh, I got to the Weather Channel, um, you know, the big thing for the Weather Channel is, is hurricanes. That's kind of our, our Super Bowl, so to speak. But once Vortex 2 started in 2009, uh, the Weather Channel really committed to covering severe weather on a grander scale uh, and a little bit more intimate and, and actually getting people out there and showing you what happens. Usually when it comes to severe weather tornadoes, usually television is very reactionary uh, and you, you go after the fact, you wait for something to happen, then you go and you cover the aftermath. We decided we'd go beforehand and we'd stay afterhand if need be. Uh, so we got to embed with the Vortex 2 project. It was great, you know, being with all these amazing scientists that are doing terrific <coughs> research. And in 2009, saw, um, as, as a lot of you probably know, the Goshen, Wyoming tornado, which was fabulous. I mean, it was awesome. We got the full live broadcast um, from start to finish of a tornado that lasted about 25 minutes in a big, wide open area in Wyoming, and it was, it was really spectacular. Great science. For us, it ended up being amazing television. It was the first time the Weather Channel had ever broadcast a live tornado. And it was, it was just awesome. 
And then we fought along with them during their second year and had another great season, a lot of different uh, places and tornadoes. And then Vortex 2 wrapped up in 2010, but we decided that we would continue our coverage the following year. We would just go on our own without, without a science project to follow. That year was a pretty slow year, actually. 2011 was dreadfully slow until, you know, uh, the, super, the super outbreak course of 2011, then it got real slow in May, and everything just kind of turned off. And then Joplin happened, uh, and a lot of a lot of people in this room were, were nearby, um, and we happened to be there very, very quickly, uh, and got there and started reporting on the damage about nine minutes after it had touched down. It was something I had never seen before. Um, I had never seen people just coming out of their homes, truly bloody messes, and they are just, it was devastating. Um, uh, probably the, the most impactful tornado that I've ever covered before. And then 2012 uh, came along, a lot more, a lot more pictures in 2012, although another fairly dry May. Um, and then 2013, which was, as we all know, a very um, interesting year to say the least. And, and uh, Oklahoma just happened to be kind of ground zero for a lot of things, including more, and then, of course, El Rita. So I'm going to kind of walk you through and give you a play-by-play -play of what happened to our crew on May 31st when the El Reno um, tornado hit. <laughs> and hopefully I'm doing this right. Um, we travel in a caravan of three. Uh, we have a lead vehicle. Um, two, we have two Suburbans generally that we ride with, and then a, a rear vehicle, which is not a radar. It's actually a, a mobile satellite truck. So our lead vehicle has an engineer in it, usually a, a cameraman, and a lot of extra equipment. Things break and what have you. We have somebody there to fix it. And then I ride in the middle vehicle, which is myself and our producer, which usually is our driver. And then another meteorologist in the back seat, or Dr. Forbes in the back seat, or another cameraman in the back seat. And then our rear, rear vehicle is our broadcast truck, which has two engineers in it, and one that operates a satellite truck, and one that is a driver and an audio engineer. So basically how it works is the middle vehicle and the rear vehicle talk to each other through microwave. And so we have all of our dash cams and roof-mounted cameras and all that stuff in our vehicle that I ride in. And it basically sends a microwave signal back to the, maybe you can see the antennas on the top of the vehicles here. This vehicle has all kinds of cameras mounted on it and some weather instruments. But if you see the front here, there's um, antennas at the top on the roof. Those are microwave receivers. So basically it receives a signal from the vehicle that I ride in. And then they encode that <coughs> dash cam and send it up on the satellite which is in the back there, that big round ball. Basically, it's a gyro-stabilized satellite that NBC had built to cover the Iraq War. So they could embed with the Army when they invaded Iraq, and they could broadcast the war live. Um, they basically repainted it from camo to white, and we've used it for tornado chasing. It's basically a, it's a, it's a satellite dish that they use for cruise ships. So it takes the swaying motion of the ocean, and it's how you get TV and internet on a boat and communications. They just happen to put it on the back of a truck. And since you know our whole goal is to be Johnny on the spot and broadcast quickly, this is about as quickly as you can do it. And we get to broadcast in HD, and it's it's really um, been amazing for us, and it's it's really done wonders for us when it comes to covering severe weather. We also have wireless cameras, you know, so once we get out of our vehicle, um, myself and a cameraman can, can kind of go wherever we want, which is a great thing to have. You're not tethered to anything, so if you happen to come upon something like in Moore, where logistics are very difficult, it's hard to get around, it's hard to walk around, you don't want to be tethered by a big long wire that goes back to your truck and you can only have limited, mobi limited mobility. So 
became very advantageous to us during Joplin and, and very um, advantageous to us for our coverage when we were in Moore a couple of hours after it had touched down. We actually um, were a little bit south of Moore by about an hour and a half and ended up coming back to Moore to do the coverage and ran into huge traffic jams and it was just a real, um, it was a real nightmare of getting there. But once we got there, then, you know, it was a devastation very similar to what we had witnessed in, in Joplin. Now, on May 31st, let me back up, May 30th, we had chased and ended up in Tulsa. And uh, we started our day on May 31st in Tulsa, and we're going to work our way back into central Oklahoma because that's where it looked like severe weather was likely to hit. And that afternoon, we stopped off at Scott's Tasty Burger in Sepulpa. Had some great burgers and fries and shakes. Anyone ever eaten there before, by the way? Anyone ever been there? Not bad, huh? Um, and it just so happens that one of our executive producers at the Weather Channel, his parents own it. Um, so, mom and dad had the whole crew in for, for lunch that day, and things were going great. It was, uh, it was a really nice afternoon, but we, uh, we chowed down because we knew it might, it might be our last meal that day, because, you know, once it gets going in the afternoon and evening, you often don't have a lot of time to stop and eat. So that afternoon, Storm Prediction Center issues uh, PDS Watch, I like the tornadoes, strong tornadoes, wind, uh, the whole deal, it includes Oklahoma City. So we're still on, our, on the move, we, we end up in Guthrie, uh, middle of the afternoon, and we're just going to park it there. There's a, it's always a nice spot off I-35, and you can see the sky pretty good, there's a nice little hill there. We're just going to park it there for a little while, and just check out the sky. I'll probably have to drift a little bit west from there. So we decide we're going to go get a little bit west as the uh, towers start to build. And we're going probably somewhere near El Reno, and the phone rings. And it's NBC Nightly News. And they say, this is about 4.45 Central Time. They say, oh, by the way, you're the lead story for Brian Williams tonight, Nightly News. you got to be on, 45 minutes. And we're like, what? <laughs> All right, change of plans, guys. So we, what, what we need to do is we just need to find some weather in the background. And so some storms had started building north of I-40. So we're like, all right, well, let's detour here up toward these storms around Kingfisher. And um, what, what's interesting about how we broadcast is, you know, every now and then there's a, a bridge, an overpass, tall trees, and our satellite truck can't broadcast through solid objects. So every now and then, if you ever watch the Weather Channel's coverage, the shot goes to black or for a moment or whatever. The Weather Channel is usually pretty good about rolling with that. Brian Williams is not good with rolling with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we, have, we, we have to stop. And we have to find a, a proper location where the satellite signal is good, audio and video checks, so New York doesn't freak out. Um, because the last thing they want is Brian Williams to toss to a blank screen. So we set up in Kingfisher, we do our broadcast for nightly news, and then hop back in the trucks and we see tornado now being reported in El Reno. So we're not exactly where we want to be. So now we have to hustle and get south to El Reno where there are now reported tornado. So it takes us a little while to get there. We're 20, 25 minutes later. <coughs> we end up right here. Uh, the yellow dot is us. We're just south of Interstate 40 right on Highway 81. And I'm going to show you a video clip here of our initial broadcast when we first saw the tornado.
<laughs> Better get out of there, Mike. <laughs> Sound advice, Dr. Forbes. <laughs> Tornado, obviously, very large tornado behind us here. And our, uh, we're close. Cameras on top of us, and we're going to roll just to stay safe, okay? We're back with you in just a minute, but huge, violent tornado. Eris. Guys, that's it. Right there. There's the tornado. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dipped the audio here a little bit. I'll give you a little commentary of what's happening. We stopped, and uh, we were stopped for one minute. We were able to broadcast. We broadcast for exactly two minutes. Um, from this perspective, we're north and east of the tornado at this point. Uh, Dr. Forbes and Chris Warren are in the studio doing radar analysis of this, and then we decide that maybe we, we're not in the best location. Maybe we should try to to hustle south and, and maybe get away from this. I think we have to go down in order to stay ahead of this and not get run over by it. So guys, I think we're going to get back in our cars. We're going to try to keep our cameras on top of this. And we're going to roll just to stay safe, OK? We'll be back with you in just a minute. A huge, violent tornado right now approaching Union City, south of El Reno, Oklahoma. All right, Mike, you be safe and do what you got to do, buddy. <coughs> All right, famous last words. <laughs> So here is the uh, here again is our location at uh, 612 is when we started broadcasting. This is the tornado track uh, here. So we broadcast up until 615. Stopped at 612. Broadcast 613 through 615, and then the tornado uh, roughly 1.6 miles wide, and we're roughly two and a half to three miles away from it at this point. Um, you know, maybe uh, some discrepancies on how big the tornado actually was, but uh, at this point, our best guess is that's how big it was. So we decide we're going to go south. And we're going to try to get south of the tornado for our purposes. Usually, being south is the best place for us for a couple of reasons. Now, uh, we like to be out of the hail, out of the rain, um, because our satellite truck can't broadcast through those things. We've been in hailstorms before and seeing these beautiful tornadoes in just outside of Oklahoma City and we couldn't broadcast because we had what's known as hail fade. The hail interrupts the satellite signal, it's too thick and you have to wait till the hail, hail clears or heavy rain will do the same thing. So we like to generally be in, in a lot of instances south because that will put us out of that hail core, out of the rain and our satellite that we are trying to hit orbits at the equator. So we generally are always trying to find a southern view of the sky. And that way we can look back toward the tornado. In most instances, it's going to be moving away from us. And so that's uh, basically the modus operandi for us as we, as we chase. So 6.15, we stop broadcast. We get in our cars. We're hammering south. Exactly four minutes later, we get struck by the tornado. Uh, and uh, it, a variety of things ended up, up happening, and I have another video I want to show you. The Weather Channel did a special after this tornado, uh, kind of a, uh, to commemorate what happened uh, to Tim and honor his work and talk about what a very dangerous day that was for so many chasers. And I'm going to show you a clip from that movie, from that special. It kind of explains what happened in the four minutes from the time we stopped broadcasting until the moment we were here. Circulation appeared to have gone almost right over Mike Bettis. Yeah. We're concerned for their safety. They have every reason to be worried. I've never been in a situation where I had to outrun a storm before. This was huge. Um, and it was scary. We gotta get ahead of it. I think the moment that I really realized that we weren't going to make it past the tornado 
show. We were hustling. We were trying to get past this thing. We didn't want any part of it. I think there became a point where I didn't care about the speed limit. We had to go as fast as we could to save our lives. And I remember communicating on the radar, guys, we have to go faster or we're gonna get hit. You have to go faster. Go as fast as you possibly can. Videographer Austin Anderson is driving while another cameraman, Brad Reynolds, tries to capture the terrifying ordeal. Brad Reynolds in the back seat uh, shooting out the window of video of the tornado. And you can see the rear window rolling up and puts the camera down but continues to roll on the camera. And you can hear uh, right before we hit the wall of wind, <coughs> Mike Bettis say, hold on, my brothers. Hold on, brothers. Hold on. Next thing I know, we're hit the passenger side. My side of the vehicle is hit, and we're going in an opposite direction. And it was the scariest moment of my life. Everybody jump, go, go, go. Just keep going if you can. Keep going if you can. Everybody jump down. Everybody jump down. The car uh, lifted up right away and went uh, airborne. You know, and I remember being weightless at one point and, and floating. As the SUV is being thrashed about by the tornado, Brad Reynolds' camera flies out of the vehicle, but it continues recording while the truck rolls multiple times. And then we stop. We land wheel side down. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm alive. Like, I'm, I'm alive. It was, I could not believe it. I thought I was dead. I remember uh, Mike Bettis yelling out to them, stay down, everybody, stay down. You all okay? You all okay? And they all screamed back, yeah, are you okay? And so we knew everyone was alive. And it was a big relief, but we weren't done yet. 150 mile an hour winds now whipping through the car and uh, uh, there could be flying debris or anything. It seemed like an eternity, but it was probably about a minute until the wind finally died down enough that I could actually look out the window and see the tornado off the distance. The crew carefully crawls out of the crushed vehicle that barely resembles the SUV it was just minutes earlier. All right, so it was, a, it was a, an interesting ride, to say the least. Uh, and you, you might have noticed Austin there. He had a neck brace on. He was our driver. He had a neck brace on, black eye. He was actually, um, you saw him at the end there, just walking around outside the vehicle, checking it out. None of us knew how serious his injuries were until... Um, we'd gone to the hospital and gotten everyone checked out. He actually um, broke some ribs um, and he cracked some vertebrae in his neck uh, that required surgery. Um, but happy to report, just last week um, he was cleared to go back to work, um, which, is, which is really good. on Highway 81 here going southbound, just north of um, 15th. And the vehicle got pushed by the wind into a cable divider that goes down the middle of the highway here. And uh, once we hit that cable divider, then the vehicle at that point was lifted off the ground. If you, I don't know if you uh, saw in that video, there was a vehicle, just as we were getting hit, there was a vehicle with flashers on, like down in the ditch. That was our lead vehicle that actually got pulled sideways off the road into the inflow. And then our vehicle was hit broadside, pushed into the cable barrier, lifted off the ground. And our engineer, who was looking out his window, said he estimates about 30 feet in the air. Uh, and our total travel distance... Uh, by the way, so, uh, Dr. Werman and his, his team measured a 185 mile per hour wind on their Dow radar at 120 meters above our exact location. Um, so a pretty, a pretty decent wind right above us. We traveled about 125 yards and 
um, get deposited into the field here. About half of that was in the air. Um, and then the second half of that was tumbling, as you saw there, until we came to rest, thank goodness, um, right side up. There's a look at, uh, Mike Dross's look at the um, 88D radar, the white dot there, TWC, that was our location. And it looks like most of the, the most violent part, the parent circulation, was just barely to our north. Now, we had actually penetrated most of the circulation unknowingly. Um, but remember how, our, how we travel in our vehicles. We travel in three, and we're six, eight, ten car lengths apart. And our lead vehicle got pulled sideways off into a ditch. Our satellite truck never moved off the highway, and our vehicle got thrown 125 yards. So. After a lot of discussion with a lot of folks that have surveyed this and with Dr. Forbes, our best <coughs> summation is that we were likely cut right down the middle of our caravan by a sub-vortex that hit our vehicle right broadside. Um, 224 mile per hour winds with this radar just north of us. And a lot of uh, vortices everywhere, you know, within the storm. Probably witnessed a dozen myself. And I'm going to go ahead and show you a kind of a compilation of some of the uh, a movie of a compilation of a lot of the vortices that we saw with this storm. And we'll go ahead and play that, guys. Um, because it was amazing. Not unusual, truly, to see um, multi-vortex, you know, mesosystems <laughs> like this. But this one had more than I had ever seen before. It was, it was really stunning. I know a lot of you probably have seen the video, but this is just kind of a compilation of some of the things. And these can add, you know, as much as 100 miles an hour to the parent circulation of the tornado and last truly just seconds as you see here, and likely something like this is what hit our vehicle. And this is a view that we had right there. You can see some, uh, some vortices within it, and truly wild stuff. Uh, so, uh, you saw the vehicle. It was a mess, um, crushed, airbags deployed, side airbags deployed. I remember hitting my head on the side airbag. My front airbag is disabled because we have a lot of computers that I, that I have in the front seat. So our engineers turn off the airbag to the passenger side so that it doesn't launch computers in my face. At this point, it wasn't necessary because we ended up rolling sideways. But the side airbag was truly a lifesaver um, for me uh, because I, otherwise my head would have probably hit the, hit the ground. This is a look um, at our vehicle. And, and where it sits now at the uh, warehouse where the engineers put it together in New York. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty much a mess here. So the vehicle took a hard hit, um, likely somewhere near the windshield and roof when it first landed. Uh, and that's why you have, you know, everything that's really smashed in the front. The, the rear of the vehicle ended up being in, in relatively good shape, um, believe it or not. We also have a rack back there that has a lot of stuff that's um, within it. Ah, got it. Got it back. Okay. Um, but you can see the front of the vehicle, our driver's airbag. See the front of the vehicle here? The bumper actually is in really good shape. The front airbag didn't deploy for, our, for Austin. And likely the reason that he sustained cracked ribs is because he hit the steering wheel. But the side airbags went off because all the impact was on the sides. Um, and you can see the roof is down to about the headrest, and Austin is a pretty tall guy. He's about, he's a lot taller than me. He's about 6'3", uh, and so likely the roof coming down was compression on his neck, which caused um, the most severe of his injuries. Uh, ate a little bit of glass, but the doctor said that would pass, and I believe it did. <laughs> uh, things you didn't need to hear. Uh, Again, taking some of uh, the Center for Severe Weather's research and the, the max velocities within 
The tornado track, the areas highlighted here in green, uh, show some of the max winds on the tornado. The red dot there on Highway 81 is our location. Uh, so basically in the, in the teeth of it, maybe uh, on the southern side of some of the strongest winds, but nonetheless you, you kind of get the point here if we weren't in a very good spot. So uh, a little bit of time passes here and roughly five to six minutes after our team has struck Tim's, Tim, Tim's team is struck about three miles away, um, and we know the, the circumstances there. Uh, so that's, that's basically, you know, it in a nutshell. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and I want to leave some time for that, but I wanted to kind of give you the mindset of, of how we ended up where we were and how it all played out for us, and, and truly um, a situation that we had not foreseen or, or foresee happening to us again, and you never know. But the, the goal for us is, and I've, I've had this question posed to me many times before, why do you have to get so close? Why do you, why do you have to tempt fate and get so close? Uh, and it never was our intention to be closer. And, you know, we ended our broadcast there saying we want to be safer. We want to get farther away from it. And truly for our, our purposes, being closer doesn't help us at all. Um, we don't have armored vehicles. We have over a million dollars worth of trucks. So the last thing we want to do is be hit by it. Um, and for us, being farther away actually tells a better picture. Uh, when we were in Wyoming and showing the tornado in Wyoming back in 2009, um, some of the best feedback we've ever gotten from our viewers was us showing the tornado and all its structure. Dr. Forbes is analyzing it on the radar and it's telling a complete picture. And it really um, connected the dots for our viewers so they can now understand what a hook echo is, what a tornado looks like, the different structures of a tornado, the different phases it goes through, and then what it looks like on radar. So now they know what to look for when they're, we're doing it on radar. So truly for us, we don't have armored vehicles. We don't, we don't have any um, advantage to being closer. Um, in, this, in this instance, we were truly just trying to be south, get away from it, turn around and broadcast once the tornado had gone north of us. So uh, close is not really something that we, we aim to do. But that is kind of, a, that's kind of the day in a nutshell. I will take your questions. I know you might have a few, so I'll open up the floor to you now. It's still, I think we have a little bit of time. So where's that vehicle now? That vehicle is where it is. That, that, those pictures there, it sits in a um, parking lot in a warehouse in New York where our engineers build our vehicles every year. Those vehicles are rented. Hertz um, so <laughs> <laughs> wasn't any too pleased, I don't think. Um, I say, get the insurance we covered, right? Um, Would you like extra insurance? Uh, it's, it's still sitting there. We're, we're trying to figure out what to do with it at this point. Um, Good we are the ornament for your uh, studios. Well, we, the, um, there's been some discussion. Are you guys familiar with the museum in uh, Washington, D.C.? Uh, it's, it's a museum about news. And they've expressed some interest in, uh, in doing a display on weather and potentially having the vehicle on display there at least for a short period of time. So it may eventually end up at the museum for, for some period. But at this point, um, you break it, you buy it. So, it's ours at this point, so we can do whatever we want with it at this point. Maybe someday we'll make a statue out of it at the Weather Channel, I'm not sure. I know there's a lot of emotions, but I'd like to do you later. What made you decide to do this particular tornado in Washington? Uh, so, the question was, what, uh, what made you believe you were going to um, get past it? Probably, in, in my mind, we were on a highway, so we could go a good, um, a good rate of speed. Um, and probably uh, an error, an error in judging just how how close it was. It was closer than we had probably realized, and bigger than we had probably realized. But at the same time, in that in that short period of time where we stopped broadcasting and started moving, the tornado expanded by almost a mile. It accelerated forward speed from roughly 30 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour forward speed, and there was some intensification. You know, all, all things that we couldn't foresee. But I think uh, we just anticipated being able to go a decent rate of speed on a highway and getting past it and underestimating how close and how fast it was. Do you think there was some distance judgment, um, perception that each field was a little bit farther away than it was, but 
Yes, I think I think we all thought it was farther away than it was. Um, it was it ended up being a lot closer than we had thought. I thought originally that, that when we had first started broadcasting, it may have been four four miles or even farther away. In fact, it was maybe about two and a half. So it was a lot closer than we had initially had thought. Uh, so the question was, how long does it take you to, to get in your vehicles and, and go? It really doesn't take us any time at all. All the cars are just are all idling. They're in park. And really all we have to do is get in, put our seatbelts on, and go. Um, so it doesn't take us any time at all. Um, so however long it takes you to sit down and, and, and strap in and put the, the car in drive, that's it. Was, will, you, will you chase again? And, and we're making plans to do it. Um, I, I think there was, a, you know, when you when you go through something like that, initially you're very, um, it was tough. It was very difficult. And I kind of questioned why am I even doing this? Um, but I, I think, in a sense, you know, you know, you, and it's not it's not a macho thing or anything, but you just don't want the circumstances to beat you. Um, and I think it's a learning it's a learning moment for me personally. For our crew, you know, what can we do this coming year that'll be different? What can we do to set a better example? Um, because I think, like it or not, the, the Chaser community, um, the public perception is not that good. And, and what played out last year didn't help. Um, and so is there, is there a, can we use the, the medium of television and, and what we do at the Weather Channel to help that message? To help change that perception, to do things um, and, and publicly acknowledge what happened and say, here's the, the changes that we're implementing so that we'll be smarter, safer chasers in the future. <laughs> that was for the Weather Channel. Yes, I'll, I'll address that. Our satellite truck, um, I'll answer your first question first. The satellite truck, the dish was blown off the back of it. Uh, we never found the dome. We never found it. It's somewhere. And the dish got all crumpled, so we, we have to replace it. And it actually is being delivered in the next couple of weeks. And it, it only takes the guys a couple of days to install it. Um, and then your question about the broadcast, which, what trumps what, right? Um, we love to be able to show it live. Um, because that's, that's the ability that we have. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt us to just tape it sometimes. Um, I think the point you're probably trying to make is the whole nightly news thing. If you hadn't had to stop and, and, and do a broadcast for nightly news, would this have happened? I don't know. Um, it didn't help, I can tell you that. It put us in a, in a, in a, the last thing you want to do, especially during the prime time hours of chasing, is have to stop. Because um, you're, you're, you're constantly trying to maneuver, especially when the weather is, is ever-changing. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't help us, probably. We ended up being in north, farther north than we wanted to be. Um, but the broadcast for the Weather Channel, um, that you, that was, which is what you saw there. Um, generally, the moment that I saw a nice wide shoulder was the moment I said, there's the tornado. We had seen the tornado prior, but there were a lot of buildings and trees and stuff in the way, and we couldn't get a good vantage point. Um, so, as soon as we were going south on 81, we saw a big wide shoulder that was big enough for our three vehicles. We said, okay, this is our spot, let's stop and broadcast, because there it is. Um, in retrospect, had we not stopped and just kept going, we'd have been clear. Um, or, had we just stayed where we were and not gone south, we'd have been outside of uh, the parent circulation of EF-01. So how did you guys manage to deploy that camera? <laughs> I mean, um, one of the wildest things I've ever seen. I mean, what are the odds that 
your camera would, would be ejected out of the out of the car and perfectly frame your vehicle rolling through the field. I mean, it gets, I mean, my hands sweat when I see it. When my wife first saw it, I mean, she was, first she had tears, and then she punched me in the arm as hard as she could. And she just, you know, don't ever do that again. Um, but just, what, was, what was interesting about the next day is that our cameraman, Brad, who, by the way, didn't have a scratch on him. In the back seat, his camera that flew out the window, not a scratch on him. Um, his camera, he found his camera in the field, you know, was kind of mangled, but he hit the play button on him and went, oh my God, look at this. Um, and we didn't, he, he had no idea. It didn't work. I mean, the camera wouldn't record anymore, it would only play, mm -hmm. but it was, it was a pretty remarkable get. Um, he, no idea. Flew out the window, landed in a muddy, muddy field, and that was it. <laughs> Uh, sure. Uh, ask, asking, you know, as a meteorologist and a broadcaster, how does it affect how you, how you chase future storms? I think the messaging is the most important thing. I think the meteorology hasn't changed so much. I think the messaging will change this year, and I think the tactics um, will change a little bit. Uh, you know, I think there, there are a lot of things. I talked to, to Roger a, a lot after that, and, and some of the things that he does with his tour group to ensure safety. You know, what do you do on PDS days? Or what do you do when it's Central Oklahoma? Which I hate chasing in Central Oklahoma. It's just a lot of people. It's a big city. There's a lot of trees. These types of things. It's dangerous. Um, so our, our is chasing in larger cities off limits to us anymore? And it's certainly something that we're considering. But I think you, uh, I think uh, as a broadcaster, I, nothing thrills me more than being able to show a live tornado in beautiful HD on the Weather Channel. That to me, as, a, as an early meteorologist, early in my career, was always my goal. It would be so awesome to show a live tornado on TV. I think over the years, though, the interest has waned a little bit because it used to be it was really rare that you ever saw a tornado caught on camera. Now it's rare that you don't see one caught on camera. Um, and, there, and it's such a fleeting moment. You know, it happens in just minutes. But it's that moment of, of excitement and adrenaline that you actually got up that morning, you forecast, and you position and you broadcast, and it all worked out for you beautifully. But I think as a broadcaster, you love being able to show people that moment. As a meteorologist, you have to balance your excitement seeing you know, this weather phenomenon with saying the right things on TV. And, so and you guys going to try to switch your messaging to more of a preparedness than necessarily the drama? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I think there's a, I think there can be a dramatic moment when it's happening. I think that the messaging, and it has been that way, but maybe I think it's going to be more so this year, is that here's where it is, and we have to really remember, and, and in the studio they're very, very good about it, but we have to be better about it in the field, saying what's happening, where it's going, who's in danger, and what actions you need to take to stay safe. You know, I think sometimes you're caught up in the wow moment, and you aren't delivering the message that you need to deliver. Yes, um, it, it's, um, I, 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 I will say this, you know, we, we say so many things out, we've seen so many things out in the field, and we've dodged hail and lightning and wind and everything else, and you probably have this moment of invincibility that you feel, you know, sometimes. Um, I, I don't think I feel that anymore. Um, but, you know, we get poked, listen, it's, 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 not, it's not a week that goes by that we're not on Colbert or on... Uh, all right, the late night show is making fun of us about doing something in weather stuff. So. Uh, by the way, I was watching that note. It said, no, go north, go north. Just... <laughs> you should have called me. <laughs> <laughs> How much has the forecasting advanced in the last five years since Vortex? Um, I think the science is always improving. Uh, you know, the research is still ongoing um, from Vortex. They have, I was just talking with um, 
Paul Markowski, who is one of the lead meteorologists for the Vortex Project from Penn State, and he's like, we have so much new data, new, new stuff that we don't know what to do with it yet. It's stuff that's never been collected before. Um, and so it, it, it's now stuff we have to sift through and figure out what to do with it. How do, how do we write algorithms or models that takes this data that we collected and does something useful with it? Um, so I think we'll get there. Uh, it's, it's kind of baby steps because we're in the infancy of this great data collection that we just had. Um, Ida, who is our little mascot, um, she's missing. <laughs> so maybe we'll get a new one. It was a, it was a little um, top of a bowling trophy that we had found in an abandoned house in Oklahoma one year. And the guys, you know, in the downtime that you have, which is a lot, said, hey, look at this. And they put her right in the front of the uh, tire of satellite truck. So she's, she's uh, MIA right now. But, uh, maybe we'll find her. I don't know. Maybe someone's got her out there. Uh, two questions. Is the sat truck, was that the Bloom Mobile? That is the Bloom Mobile, yes. That's the same vehicle that David Bloom um, uh, from NBC News used to broadcast the war. And the second question is, the culture, since you have local experience and now national, what's the major difference in the culture you see working with national, and do you feel that led into any decisions made for El Rio? Uh, it's different broadcasting local and national. I mean, there's more of a, I mean, you, you're, you're focused solely on one place. Um, when you're in local and you're much more part of a community when you're in local than you are in national. Um, I don't think, but your message is bigger when you work for someone like the Weather Channel, but I don't think it has influenced how I broadcast in particular. Uh, we're already part of the spotter network, um, but we are making plans to be out there again uh, this year. Um, we'll see what we, we'll, <laughs> there's some logistic things to work out with our broadcast truck and some new vehicles. Um, we'll hopefully get that all, all worked out and some things that we're trying to produce now to talk about tornado safety um, this year. Uh, the question was, have you talked to, you know, internally about what happened that day and, and what you would do and, and what would you do differently um, in the future? Uh, we have definitely discussed, you know, what happened that day and what we can do going forward, you know, to, to ensure our safety. Our, our crew has all, we've always discussed amongst our group, which is um, seven or eight people, you know, what happens when you're in a dangerous situation. And it's always, the number one thing, it's always, Make sure you have your, your seatbelt on. Um, and all of us had our seatbelts on. And uh, the one thing that the Red Cross always recommends if you happen to be in your vehicle and struck is get down below window level. Um, and it was the la only thing going through my mind when I knew we were going to get hit, and, and maybe you heard the video, there was duck down, duck down. And I, on my face was down in the seat. Half of my body was on the floor. Um, and so I, I think that is something that we've always thought about. Um, Going forward, I think that the, the thing is, um, listen, the Weather Channel is going to get the video of the tornado either way. Whether it comes from us, or it comes from one of you, or it comes from a local station, it's not uber imperative for me personally to always have to have the tornado. Um, I think it's great when it happens, but I'm not, going forward, I'm not going to risk my safety or the safety of the crew in order to get that shot. Um, we can always record it and feed it back afterwards. It's just as impactful on tape moments later as it is live. What did Brian Williams say to you about this? Uh, I got an email from Brian Williams, <laughs> and he said, um, I think the first words were, hell of a ride. Uh, <laughs> um, but, just, just concerned about uh, ever how everyone was doing and the safety and, and just saying thank. And he really was quite gracious. He said thank you for for doing the broadcast and sorry that that happened to you. Mike, didn't you say for everybody to remember to chase like your families in the back seat? 
Yeah, um, and that's, you know, that's, think about that, you know, for a second. If, uh, if I had, maybe different for me because my wife is a meteorologist, but if I had my wife, I say if I had my dog in the back seat, I'd probably be more careful than anyone. Um, so, no slight to my wife. Maybe a great way, you know, to think about it. Chase is if you had your family in the backseat. We, we broadcast with a five second delay at the Weather Channel. I, I would never have aired if you'd have been live, but. <laughs> 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 uh, you have no idea the F bombs that Dr. Forrest throws out. <laughs> spotter class, and then find an experienced um, chaser to go with, um, and kind of learn the ropes so that you, you understand how it works. Um, I think one thing it, it has done, and it's increased the amount of people that are out there. A lot more, I've noticed it in the past 